we will be in tangent. But it's next to the list. But I'm pretty sure. EKG. So the EKG is the electrical activity of the heart. So all that, it, it, it just is that wave, and it should be regular. We shouldn't be seeing a lot of weird beats. You guys aren't responsible for interpreting EKGs. But if you start to see wide and bizarre complexes, if you start seeing beats being dropped, you just need to alert the doctor. And as time goes on, as an anesthetist, we can certainly start working on diagnose. We can help you kind of diagnose things. It can be kind of fun. But in general, you should be watching the EKG for abnormalities like drop beats and, and bizarre complexes. It is absolutely not reliable in assessing whether or not your pet is alive or dead. Do not rely on the EKG because that the EKG will continue to do its thing well after the pet is deceased. So do not do not rely on the EKG. Doppler would be better. Uh, catnograph. So the catnograph are the CO2 monitor. Oh, sorry. Measure wherever that thing is, measures the exhaled CO2 which is supposed to be close to like the blood CO2. So that also is a measurement of how well the pet is ventilating. So of all the numbers gained, unfortunately this one is opposite. So as the number gets higher, that usually means that that pet is not breathing. Because when you breathe, you're breathing out CO2. So the faster you breathe, the lower the CO2 gets. And the less you breathe, the more it fills up. So that one's the opposite. So as you get deeper, you're not breathing. So your CO2 is going to go up. As you get lighter, a lot of times you're... So the CO2 is going to be lower. Uh, the, one thing I, the one point I was going to make to is that this should never... this. Um, adapter, what is it, what is it, or CO2 adapter, should never be smaller than the endotracheal tube. So, the diameter of this thing. So, choose wisely because basically, if you, if you choose smaller than the size of their endotracheal tube, then you're creating a tremendous amount of resistance for that pet. It's like them breathing through a coffee straw. So, don't do that. And we should have all the right sizes. Do we have all the right sizes now? It should, it should be now. Mm -hmm. So that is why these are important to have all the sizes. Lovely that we have our management team here because it actually is extremely important. Like we can't, like one size does not fit all. So this is the CO2 monitor. Okay, CO2. So thermometer, body temperature. What do you think as you get deeper, Sydney? Where do you think your temperature is going to go? High or low? It's going to drop. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, so when do you think you're going to act? If a pet starts off at, at like 102, when do you think you're going to start doing extra stuff for that pet? Like, at, at what body temperature do you think you're going to start like? A hundred. 101.5. We don't want that test drop body to drop at all. I don't want it to drop at all. It's okay. No, we don't want it to drop at all. And so you want to be pressed. Sorry, she's asking. You're trying to. Yeah, Keep that track for her basically. Okay, so if a pet starts off at 102 degrees when you induce them, I said, Sydney, when are you going to start being proactive? What At what temperature, if you notice that it's dropping, which are you going to start like doing more stuff? You already got the bear hunter. You already got the fluid warmer. You already have blanket, which is just, all of that is standard. So when are you going to start doing extra stuff? As soon as the temperature starts to drop, you're going to be proactive. Because sometimes it's hard to get it back. So you might get, if it's a little pet, I mean, that temperature will drop like a rock. 
So what you, if it starts to drop like right after induction, I mean, you don't know where it's going to bottom out, but that means you got to start piling it on. <laughs> I know Beth was like washing those clothes yesterday. I love it. So, um, so we want to be proactive. We do not want to wait until that pad temperature is is low. When it becomes 102, what should we be doing? So, so are question. you saying if it's elevated? It's at, like it's at 102, 102 is technically within the realm. So say it's 104. Yeah, right. What 104? 105 obviously we might do things but the deal is is that what can happen is that we never want a pet's temperature to drop precipitously i don't care if it's 110 like you want it to you don't want it to drop like a rock you want it to drop it drops faster than it goes up yeah. so if you have a high, if you have a heat stroke pet you stop cooling them at like 104 103 and a half, 104, because it's going to keep dropping. So, so we don't want that to happen with our anesthetized pets. So, in general, like if their temperature is high, say 104, which commonly will happen, it's not like we're going to leave our blankets off. We might, we might not turn the bear hugger on, and we might turn it on medium, but we don't want that 104 to go to 98. How many numbers is that? What is that? Six? That's six. That's six degrees drop. That's a huge drop. That does a lot of bad things to their thermoregulatory system. Sometimes they can have seizures when they when it drops that much. And so we want to just try to get it in, you know, thread the needle and just kind of keep it at, you know, 1025. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. That's what I was talking about. I would about. never know, I mean, again, unless unless that a, I don't know that I, there would ever be a time where I wouldn't put a blanket on a pet because it's going to drop. And I, I think that especially, like we said, the temperature drops so quickly after the induction of anesthesia. Like it, like it, I feel like that, especially those pets, because they're vaso, when your temperature is high, you're vasodilated. So your, your body is putting off heat already. And so as soon as you dry, as soon as you put the motor in anesthesia, I mean, it is going to plummet. I, I would say that you guys must have seen that just when pets are hyperthermic when you induce them. It drops pretty quick, right? We don't need to help it drop. We just need to let it normally drop. So just, most of the time, just do your normal stuff. Okay, next thing. In general, it says it right here. Use your eyes and your ears rather than your equipment for sure. Right, and we're going to go through how to how more to use your eyes and ears, but we're not going to rely on our equipment. There's a lot of stuff that we can do without equipment. This is very helpful, but we don't, we don't rely just on equipment. The power apparently goes off a lot lately, and we still can monitor anesthesia. All right, so how do we monitor the depth of anesthesia? What does that mean, depth of anesthesia? <laughs> So that means whether they're deep or light, right? How do we monitor that? So one of the most important things is the position of the eye. So I'm going to go to palpable reflex. I guess what's on next. So first is the palpable. Who knows how to do the palpable reflex? This is the, the, the blink reflex, right? So there is some nuance to it. It can be fatigued. It is a very gentle, very gentle tap right at the medial canthus. Wearing a glove oftentimes makes it very difficult to elicit. It has to be just a very tiny tap. And so if that is present, then that pet is in a lighter plane of anesthesia. If it is, if it is absent, they are in a deeper plane of anesthesia. That's what that tells us. And now we're going to incorporate that in with the eye position to help us sort of paint another picture. So the eye position is either going to be central, and that means that the pet is looking at you, or it's going to be ventral medial, which is rolled down, where you just see the whites of their eyes. See everybody, has everybody seen that? Everybody, everybody, everybody. Oh, hello, Anna. So if they're central, it can be one of two things. That means they're too light or too deep. 
that gets complicated, right? So if they're central and their pupils are really tiny and they have a palpebral reflex, what do y'all think that might mean? There might be a light and they're about to wake up. Because if the, if the pupils are small, that means that they're so awake that they're responding to light. So you better be prepared for something. Like if you're try if you're about to do something painful, you might need to alter your gas. So we're gonna do the dance. So the, again, the goal is to be anticipate what's happening. So you should be able to predict like your trend is that maybe you're light, but you're trending deep, or you're deep and trending light. So um, if they're ventral medial, you have the whites of their eyes. Sometimes they will still have a palpebral reflex. That's a, that's a nice sweet spot. You can, if you can maintain that and they're not painful, that's a beautiful place to be. I'd say that that's like, you know, hard to come by sometimes, but ventral medial is good. That is usually the surgical plane of anesthesia. Uh, sometimes you miss that and you can overshoot. So in a perfect world, I would love it if you guys could you guys could assess the pet's eye position yourself and not ask other people to do it for you, because I think that that is that is the anesthetist's job because the person that's doing the dental or whatever is not able is doing something else, and so you as as the anesthetist should be constantly looking and anticipating and seeing what is about to happen next, and so the eye position is the window to that pet's soul. And it can tell you a lot of stuff if you pay attention. But you have to pay attention a lot, not just like sometimes. So, um, so if the pet is central and dilated, dilated means death, so deep. Dilated, death, deep. So if you have a, a, a pet that has a central, like their pupils are central and deep, you don't have to panic, because what else are you going to look at? Joyce, what's first? What else are you going to look at? The heart rate, the blood pressure. The, the Absolutely. You're going to use your whole blood. picture. You're painting a picture. Yeah. It's going to tell, like, it's not just one thing. But if it, but you know, if you're like, oh man, the heart rate dropped, the blood pressure dropped, and I got a pupil that's central and dilated, you better be about to wet your pants. <laughs> like, you better be doing something about that. What are you going to do? Turn it down, turn it off. Yeah. Say say you get a, a pupil that's like central and kind of kind of dilated, and you don't like you just don't know what happens if you don't know. Turn it down and see what happens. If you don't know, what's the worst thing that can happen? What is the worst thing that can happen? No, no. Look at their eyes before the procedure. Make yes. sure they don't have like these query where like ones like yes. John, you know, if they've just been that. given like an atropine eye drop, you know, and it's just, okay. I know where you're starting. Any, anyway, but what it what's the worst thing that happens? They wake up. What's the worst thing that happens if you if you don't know and you do nothing? They die. Or their blood pressure drops to a low and you damage their kidneys. So in general, like if you get lost, and everyone does, I mean, a lot of times I'm like, I can't, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if they're light or deep or whatever. Like the blood pressure's been crap the whole time. I don't know, heart rate's all over the place. Can't get the pump blocks to work. Just turn them down and see what happens. And you, you know, it might be good to let your doctor know that, hey, I'm just, I, I don't know what's going on. I can't really assess the depth of anesthesia. So I need to turn this pet down and see what happens. You know, so maybe they shouldn't be drilling at that exact moment. But turn them down. That's the only way you can hit restart is to stop, like to let them wake up and figure out what happened. Okay, what's next? Um, muscle tone. Okay, that's a good one. So jaw tone, anal tone, muscle rigidity. So obviously, uh, the deeper you get under anesthesia, the looser you're gonna be, right? Um, right. <laughs> I will say you gotta get loose. So um, I will say that if you have a pet like in my experience, if you have a pet that's like especially like with anal tone, like if you have a pet that starts losing a lot of anal tone, I feel like that that is a good indication that you're like too deep. You know, again, we're not going to use that as our only parameter, but with you know, 
You mean like releasing glands and stuff? No. Just like t talking about like so when you put a thermometer in, they squinch their butt normally, oh. right? So if they're not squinching their butt and it's actually yeah. like flaccid, oh. then yeah, you might want to like reassess things. Okay, heart rate. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. So you want them to have some level of muscle tone? Yes, we do not want them to be like a ball of jello. Okay. Heart rate and respiratory rate. These are general rules of thumbs. I know that there are exceptions to all this stuff, and, and sometimes drugs can affect it, so we're not going to go down those rabbit holes. But heart rate, what do you think? If they're light, it's going to be what? High. High or low. What? Light. If they're lighter, they're going to be? Higher if they're if it's low, it's they're deeper, right? Higher, lighter, lower, deeper. Respiratory rate, same thing. Higher, lighter, lower, deeper. And then uh, body temperature, it's all the same. Uh, okay, and so what's the general rule of thumb? For our like monitoring game, we're gonna we're gonna leave out the CO2 because that one's a little bit opposite. <laughs> but other than that, what's the general rule of thumb, Colleen? Higher, That's right. <laughs> Do you believe it? Yep. <laughs> believe it. <laughs> okay. And then, what's the, what is the CO2? It's obviously opposite. Does everyone understand the CO2? Does everybody understand? I know this one always gets a little tricky uh, when we when, when I grade the test, like half of the people miss the question. I don't know. Do you really not? So with the respiratory rate, high when you're light or awake, your respiratory rate is elevated. When you're asleep, it's low. And so when you breathe a lot, you're breathing out a lot of CO2. So your your body CO2 is going to be low. So when and when you're asleep, you're going and not breathing, you're not you're not exhaling as much CO2, so you're gonna the numbers are gonna get higher. Does that make sense? It takes a, a little bit of brain twist to understand it, but okay, so Okay. What are the the most common cause of anesthetic death, humans and animals, is it's on your notes. Human error, that is absolutely right. In general, if a pet dies, it's usually because somebody screwed up. I mean, obviously there are exceptions to that rule, and there are reasons, other reasons, but it's usually because, like, most of the times what I've seen is somebody screwed up. And so don't let that happen to you. If you're not a little bit afraid of anesthesia, you do not know enough about it, because it is a scary thing sometimes. Because that pet's life is 100% in your hands and you can kill it very easily. So it's a very serious thing and it's not to be taken lightly. So, um, and you know, one mental error can, can you know, cause that pet its life. Uh, um, and to add into that, as the anesthetist, you are absolutely to never leave your patient. That means never. If that means, hey, did, can you go get me some suture? Can you help me take this catheter out? No. Do not ever leave your patient. Your job is to monitor that pet. At some point, I think we're going to try to, to change things around and, and not have the anesthetist even involved in the dental x-rays. They need to be monitoring anesthesia. So that would hopefully be that everyone needs to get confident in doing dental x-rays. But the anesthetist's job is to, to monitor the pet. And if they're doing it like if they're doing it well, then they need to be focused on that pet. So they can't take phone triages and they can't do any of the other stuff. They need to be focused on monitoring anesthesia. I mean, why do you think that we're able to, to anesthetize 20-year-old pets? Why do you think most practices don't do it? It's because it's hard, and it requires training and focus, and so don't get, do not get distracted. Um, okay, equipment failure. Check the circuit. 
something's going wrong, always check the circuit. We were talking about that earlier. Weird things happen. Pet's not going to sleep. Check the circuit. All right, something weird. Yeah, it's almost every time. Okay. Patient one day to stay down. Yes, check the circuit. The pet is too deep. What are you going to do? Turn, it off. turn down the gas or turn it off. That one's a good one. Yes. Um, all your monitors fail. What are you going to do? Scream and cry and call Beth? Yeah, I mean, you got, we just went over like nine things that don't require any, like any monitoring at all. Any like equip, fancy equipment. Luckily, so use your eyes and your ears and your hands. And the, be the more you get used to it, the, the better you get at it. And also, if there's a temporary like power outage or whatever, you should know if that pet is light trending deep or deep trending light. You should know what's happening with that pet. So if everything turns off, you should already have an idea of like what, what the next thing is going to happen. Um, your pa patient is pale or blue. What, what might that be? Sometimes those pets are awake. This can happen in the very first part of anesthesia. Man. <clears throat> Pale or blue usually means, blue usually means that they're not oxygenating. And so things that can happen if they're not oxygenating, maybe the oxygen's not on. Check that, obviously. But also, sometimes what can happen on little tiny dogs is that the tube gets put, put in too far. And it it's like basically the tube is all the way into like one side of the lung and then that pet can oxygenate but it also is not getting enough gas to go to sleep so those pets are blue and awake so that's when you have sometimes you need to pull the tube out a little bit deflate pull the tube out see what happens or you could probably uh just reintubate all together something like that but obviously call in the reserves find your doctor Hopefully they haven't left the building yet. Uh, the patient is not breathing. Your heart's not beating. What are you going to do? Bree, what are you going to do? What's the first thing you're going to do? Turn off the gas. I can't say this enough. I cannot say this enough. When in doubt, turn off the gas. The first, the, this pet is going to die. The gas will kill it faster than anything else. The most cardiovascularly depressing of all the drugs that we give, anything in that drawer that would normally be by Dr. Romano, this will kill them faster. This is extremely cardiovascularly depressing, and if they're already depressed, well, they don't need any more. So turn off the gas. The ice cream gas. Yeah, I just. The isoflurane, thank you, Ellie. <laughs> um, you can consider disconnecting and flushing. Yes, the that's a good point. So in particular, yes. Yeah. Because we have had, I mean, I can't, Joyce, how many times has this happened? And that's, and, and, it, and people forget. It's, I mean, you, people, I mean, I'm saying that this is going to be like your, like you want to pee your pants and you feel like you're going to throw up at the same time and I, I just it, it's this is not i mean i'm not kidding and like you're going like you're in like panic mode everybody's in panic mode and so you as the anesthetist like you have to hear my voice turn off the gas because people forget like this is not this is this it happens because everybody panics because you're trying to figure out what's going on and people are listening and everybody's jostling and there's blankets everywhere turn off the gas Joyce has heard my voice heard a few a times. Because she was like, oh, time. sorry, Ryan. She was like, oh, shit, what do I do? Because yeah. <laughs> the doctor's crying. Like, they, like, and she was like, oh, shit, what do I do? <laughs> no, and it's like, you, you won't know. All right. And so recovery. Everything's great. Now we're all done. Everybody's going to leave, right? Ready to go to lunch?
Yeah. <laughs> You're recovering. Everything's fine. You're not have to worry anymore, right? No. What did we just say earlier? Actually, 60% of cats' anesthetic deaths happen in recovery. So, don't relax. Please, this is an extremely important time. Is that 60% just cats? Sixty <clears throat> percent of cats, so the deaths, so I think, I can't remember the statistic now, but 60% of cat anesthetic deaths happen in recovery. The other 40 happen the other time. And then I'm not exactly sure on the dog, but lots of pets die in recovery, so that is not the time to relax. So, um, extubation, um, one of the big things that I know that everyone wants to, to hurry up and extubate the pet, like trying to wake them up just enough to get them to pull the tube is a terrible idea. Because it's like if you're, if you're, it's like trying to wake up like a drunk person. And you can wake them up to be like, hey man, where are your keys? Or whatever. <laughs> but then that drunk person is going to go back to sleep, right? So if you can wake them up enough to say something, they're going to go back to sleep. And so what's going to happen if you pull that tube? Joyce, what's going to happen? They're going to go back to sleep. And what is, And then what's going to happen? Their airway might cut off, and then they can't breathe, and then they'll be dead. So trying to wake them up enough to, to extubate, please don't do that. But you do want to try to wake them up, though, right? No. 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 So what do you do? Because they have to breathe. Like, have to, they're on oxygen. They're intubated. There's still residual gas in their lungs. Wake up on their <clears throat> we want them to wake up on their own time, and I would I, I would also like to I, I don't know where that three minute or five minute rule I don't know where that came from. <clears throat> there there is no documentation of, of that being a thing. Like so or... for post anesthesia oxygen, I personally would like them to remain on oxygen until they're extubated, if, depending on the timeline and the other things. But I don't think that there's any reason to not have them on oxygen. It's also when they are, when the, the tube is not connected to something, they can get aspiration sink water, which you know is a thing. <laughs> they can aspirate the dog hair that's been shaved off their face. Like things can happen. So I would rather that tube be connected to a nice, like, thick oxygen rather than something else. If that can't happen, you also just we need to be careful of the end of the tube because I have seen all kinds of things happen. Like hair, like I was saying, like hair getting sucked into that, and you know, it getting covered with a blanket, and so. Long story short, be careful in extubation as well. Um, body temperature. This is all talking about recovery. They also their body temperature can obviously also drop when they're when they're in recovery. So we want to make sure to keep them warm. In recovery, sometimes if they're really, if they have gotten cold and it happens to be a nice day outside, you can and they're, and they're extubated. You can like the ambient temperature is important, and so when it's really cold, like 70 degrees, like it's hard to get them to warm up. Or you can, we have gone into room four or whatever and turned the heater on because it, like again, they need to be breathing warm air as well. So. Um, 99 is the rule, but again, are you going to leave a 99 degree unconscious animal in the cage? Just the same as with the, with the anesthesia, all the pieces have to be in place to be able to leave that pet. You can't just check one box and go. Like they have to be conscious enough to hold their head up and ventilate, breathe on their own. They need to be an adequate body temperature, mentally conscious then they can be left with some minimal supervision. If they can't hold their head up, especially a cat, they can't sit up, you can't leave them. Okay? That's the thing. Brachycephalic, who knows what that means? Colleen, what's a brachycephalic? Smush face. So those pets are, are also a little bit special because they have small airways. They've got a lot of redundant tissue in there. And so when they get relaxed, what do you think happens with that tissue? It, and then they die. 
<laughs> they actually, I mean, they can be quite challenging to, to anesthetize and the recovery is sometimes even worse because they're like hard to extubate and then like, so we've had to re or outbacks in them a few times until the other drugs wear off where they can, because they like fight the tube, but then they're not actually awake enough to breathe. Anyway, they can be quite challenging. So be, these are things that you want to be conscious of beforehand. You want to know, like you want to be thinking about it. Like you don't want to be surprised that it's a brachycephalic in recovery. You should be thinking about that during, you know, in the pre-anesthetic period that, okay, I've got this dog, like I, got, I need to make a plan about like how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna recover them. You know, and you should be thinking about all of those things. Like you may be thinking about, okay, the next pet too, but you have to think of, make a plan for what am I going to do with this pet that could have a complicated recovery in order to move to the next procedure. Like these are all things that we should go through, go through your head. So um, is there a certain time once, like you guys reverse them, um, as far as allowing them to breathe on their own, is there a certain time limit that, like basically what I'm trying to act like you, Regardless of the time, no time. Regardless there of is no time. Okay. It is okay. we are assessing the pet. We don't there. It we can't just say three minutes and you're done. You have to like you have to watch watch the pet. So if it's taking a long time for them to actually start breathing on their own, is that a problem or are you just still kind of? So it could be a problem. So say you have a pet that had a, a spay or a neuter or something. And they're taking a really a young dog that normally should wake up fairly quickly. They're taking a, a really long time to wake up, like that's and they're maybe their gums are pale. Like that's what when you should reassess. That's when you should talk to the doctor because they could be bleeding internally, and that is a one of the most common causes of a delayed recovery is like um, excessive bleeding during surgery. So yes, that is yes there. There should be some time limit in your brain thinking of like, yeah, how long is it? Is this too long? And it's better to say, hey, Dr. Romano, I'm a little concerned that this pet is taking so long to recover. Can you come take a look or whatever? In general, they're probably breathing on their end. It's not a question of whether they're breathing, but whether it's safe to take their tube out and extubate them because they can't always protect their airway on their own. So it's a protected airway. Aspirating that keeps the airway patient and open. So they're, they're usually at that point light enough that they're breathing. It's pretty rare that we have to manually ventilate manually for them. them. That is, that's correct. And then the only exception is probably like you know, certain brachycephalics will be literally awake and they will not chew on their teeth. Oh, yeah, they like because it. Because they <laughs> never breathe like that in their life. Apparently, the Ugga, George said that when he was in med school, the Ugga that was there, that must have been like 25 Uggas ago, like when they go through every other year or whatever, that he would just walk around the vet school with the trach tube in because he was so, he had such what? a poor airway. Don't you just like spray some lidocaine, pop that bad boy in. And he just like walked around with